What's going on, guys? And welcome back to the Edison Club podcast. I'm your host, Mike, joined by co-hosts Ty, Austin Butcher, and Blake Bowman. Tonight, our episode is going to look a little bit different as I'm actually going to be letting Blake take the lead and uh, kind of go over some questions he has for us and just have a good discussion for you. So hope everyone enjoys the episode. And uh, without further ado, I will let Blake take the lead here. I've got the wheel, baby. We're driving this thing right off a bridge. Who's with me? I'm, I'm driving. <laughs> okay. Yeehaw. Never mind. <laughs> Well, thanks for having me on, Mike, and uh, thanks, Austin, Ty, for joining us. We um, have kind of a, a different topic in mind for this evening. I think on this podcast, Michael has several times discussed ways to improve as a player. He's often chronicled his own journey as a player as well, has been very vulnerable and open as to how this has kind of been um, really his hero arc in a sense. Uh, the time in all of his Yu-Gi-Oh career when he has seen the most success and has talked about that at some length. However, what we have not discussed is how and why our team as a whole is generally seeing more success than we've ever seen before, in spite of the fact that many of our guys have been playing Yu-Gi-Oh for how long? When, when did you guys, let's start with just that. When did you guys first pick up a Yu-Gi-Oh card and uh, play it in a way that coincides with Yu-Gi-Oh rules, apart from just slamming it on the table and doing your best Yu-Gi-Oh moto impersonation. Probably 2008. For me, it was probably, I want to say I played in my first tournament in like, like 05, 06, somewhere around that or somewhere around there. It was like right around like, I don't know if any of y'all remember this, like, like apprentice monarch format. Like right after goat. Mm. Yeah, I've heard of it. Yeah, no idea. Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm paid. So I'm in other paid. words, it's been a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. You're an old man. Uh, <laughs> Shut up, grandpa. I'm the grandpa. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> uh Butcher, what about you? Oh man. I was probably around goat format, although I couldn't afford anything back then. Uh we used to go to the candle shop all the time and I know you remember that place, Ty. We used to have tournaments yeah. Friday night and every Saturday night with Ron and him. I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be honest, but I really didn't know that you went to the candle shop. <laughs> oh, there's, oh yeah, I Dude. didn't. I, I, this is like, a, like a, a lore dump for me. <laughs> oh really? Yeah, me and Reese both went. Uh, we Dormant memory there. unlocked. And uh, couldn't afford hardly any of the cards because everything was expensive back then, but. Um, whatever the original Genzo came out of is when we first started playing, like, trying to be, yeah. Wait, you went when Genzo came out? Yeah. Dude, okay, 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 hang on, hang on, (laughs) hang on a second. So I went to the candle shop way back when you youngins were still, like, in diapers or something. I played, like, OG Yu-Gi-Oh there. It's true. I I was wearing diapers at eight years old. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I wasn't much older than eight when I was going, I guess like in middle school, 12, 13, 14. Um, but this is how I built my collection. I would go every week to the candle shop and I would win every single week and get four packs from Brenda. So if you played Austin, if you went there when Genzo came out, I was still playing there during Pharaoh Servant. Wow. I remember saying, oh, because Genzo was $50 back then. And I had to like do chores for a few weeks to uh, get fifteen dollars to be able to buy one Genzo for my deck. So I just I I made my collection by beating up on you every single week, and I had no idea it was you. <laughs> dude, dude, anytime, anytime I had ever won a tournament up there, like I didn't get I didn't get the packs. So she just let me pick a car out of the case. Yeah, you could do store credit, I think, but they stopped doing packs. Um, became a little cheap towards the end, but yeah. I think I phased out around the time that Lava Golem and Injection Fairy Lily came out. That was like the last, as that was coming out, I stopped going. Right. I started, that was like high school for me or something. Um, I don't even remember which pack that was. Anyways, memory lane unlocked. We're done there. Uh, the reason that I referenced this 
is I would like to now go back to a window of time that we played Yu-Gi-Oh together. Um, for the listeners, I, I, I've mentioned this before, but I have not played a ton of Yu-Gi-Oh. I've kind of been off and on throughout the years, uh, very inconsistent in the windows that I have played. Even though I started in original Yu-Gi Kaiba format, I played for like a year, two years, and then didn't play again until 2014 or maybe the very end of 2013. So let's just go there. 2013 to 2015, that was a window that we were all playing. Okay, let's talk about what you achieved during this window. Now, keep in mind, all of us have, maybe maybe me a little less, but you guys especially have accrued several years of consistent Yu-Gi-Oh experience. You all were playing by around the time of GOAT onwards. So, you know, six, seven years, if for time, maybe eight, nine years, et cetera. So talk to me about your achievements during that window of time. So Dragon Rulers through, we'll say, Necros. Okay. Go ahead, Boyd. You you lead us off. So I got ninth place at Locals one time out of eight people during those years. <laughs> and so that was a pretty good accomplishment. I played Penguin Necros. <laughs> so um, the the only real accomplishment that I had during that time was I got my first uh, Nationals invite 2014 at a Charlotte Regional playing Harpies. And I think I literally got like 46th place. So... Just barely snuck in there, but that was that was about it. And I went to that year's Nats in Detroit with uh, the with the boys, with you, Calms, Kiefer, and scrubbed out really, really poorly. Didn't get my Nats invite the year of Necros, so I really didn't really have any success in the game whatsoever. From I mean, like when I started playing up until like a year ago, <laughs> which is pretty sad to say, but. Uh, yeah, so I didn't really, I guess it was like more of the love for the game at that point rather than the accomplishments was like all that kept me going. And I just always wanted to play just off the wall crap. Literally is just what I wanted to play. And I, I wonder why I couldn't do well. Mm. Mm. Ty, what about you? Um, 2013 to 2015, like I had one, I got like one national invite at like early in 2013. And then, like that, after that, it was like real cold for me. After that, like I didn't, I didn't get a top for the rest of that time. For the rest of that time period, um, and then, like towards like the end of twenty fifteen, I took like a little bit of a break. Yeah, yeah, I, I remember at that twenty fifteen Nats, you were the unfortunate recipient of the cactus. Uh, you and Steve were going to have to split the cactus. Do you remember the cactus? <laughs> you this? Yeah. yeah, I remember. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the cactus. We had said that uh, the worst performing member at the nationals, or maybe it was like a last qualifier. Some of you guys were playing in, or I don't know. Um, and that was not a good showing for y'all. The uh, the loser was supposed to have um, a cactus enema. We'll just leave it at that. And uh, it was just it was all good and fun. Obviously, we didn't really plan on shoving a cactus up Ty's butt. But I f- I forgot about twenty fifteen being at twenty fifteen nationals. Like I only remember. Because I, I remember I played in the main event. I just don't remember what I played, play, what deck I played to get the invite. It was um, what was that deck that you milled in in uh, not Infernoids or I mean, is that what it's called? Infernoid. Oh, I, I I remember now. Uh, it wasn't Infernoid. It was uh, Bujin Shadal is what I got it. Oh, with. Bujin Shadal. Yeah, that's what it was because I got like sixteenth or seventeenth place with uh with it at uh at a Charlotte Regional. Because hmm. remember uh, remember Butcher, you, me, and Steve. I'll uh, I'll got our invite to that event because you played to Teller Knight and uh, Steve yeah. played uh, Shadal. I actually remember that. Yeah, hmm. that's what it was. Okay, okay. So not, I mean, cactus all the same, but <laughs> at least you got a Nats invite. Uh, Austin, a little bit different story for you. Why don't you talk us through your your two year window there? Um, I really feel like it's when I was in my prime. Honestly, I got an invite like all three years. Um, during Dragon Ruler format, I was playing, uh, what to say, I was playing Ophion that deck. And uh, I played really good during that time. And uh, I think the best I ever got in regionals during that time frame was like 20th or so. And then fast forward a little bit further, and then Cleforts came out. And 
within like a month of owning the deck, I got second at an OTS, and we went to Nats that year, and I got top 64. Um, and I think a month before that Nats, I actually got 10th place at a regional with Cleefort. So I was just playing really good. Every year I was getting my invite. During that time, I think I had like seven to eight regional tops, and then whatever side tournaments we were going to. I was just playing really good, I felt like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I recall that as well. And I would say a similar story for me. Um, by the time I kind of really got my feet wet into Yu-Gi-Oh! in 2014, I played Yu-Gi Kaiba, stopped around the time again. I've already mentioned a Lava Golem, whenever that set was. And didn't play again until uh, really 2014. And day two, both of those nationals did really well. Never, never went to a regional that I didn't top. Um, however, and I'll set us up for the transition in our conversation. My intro to Edison, which I began around May of last year, was met with uh, a steep learning curve. And I pretty much went 50-50 and missed out on the top cut of just about every tournament I went to for the first four or five months. We'll go reverse order here. Austin, what's been your experience so far in Edison? Uh, it's been kind of poopy, man. I mean, it's a really fun format. I really enjoy it, but I just, I'm, I'm Mr. Bubble. Everywhere we go, I'm, I'm Mr. Bubble, and I'm on the outside of that bubble. Huh. Um, I haven't really like done anything um, spectacularness at all. I think like my best place was like second at a local. You know, that's nothing really. Um, my first big tournament, which was Richmond, I believe. And out of a hundred and what thirty people void, I think I got like like forty third or something like that. Really wasn't that good. Yeah, I think that was it. Uh, and then at this last YCS we went to, you know, day one I was X two, and then day two I lost my first round, and I ended up dropping, and then that put me at like forty eighth place, I think. Whenever I dropped, so I mean, not not really good showing. I think that one's like a hundred and eighty people, but I just I feel like I've hit a wall. It's just it's a really harsh format. I came in really late to this format, like two years after everybody had been playing. Mm -hmm. And this format is just so solved in a way. And there's so many good players. Like everybody's just really, really good for the most part in Edison. Probably sixty to seventy percent of the players are just really, really good, I feel like. So it's kinda hard just to come into it and, and expect to do good. I mean, it's it's a hard format. Yeah. Yeah. More on that in just a moment. Um Let's get Ty. We'll go again reverse order. Just spit off some of your accomplishments from this past year. Um, I start like when I first like started like taking like Edison seriously. I didn't like I didn't really like I like I didn't really go into it with, like well uh, like I thought like at first I thought you know uh, okay I live through this I'll like I'll be able to like navigate this pretty easily and not like starting off when I was like playing like that wasn't the ca it wasn't the case. Um, but then like we went to, uh, me, it was like me, Boyd and Justin, I forget who else went, went to the first BBG, uh, cash tournament that they had. And I played, I uh, played black wings in that. And I got, uh, I got top eight. And then I started like throughout that year, like, you know, like whenever I was able to, I was every, every tournament I was able to go to, except for like. The cursed Picante switch tournaments. <laughs> we won't get into that. Um, I, I was able to pretty much top everything that I've been at. Yeah, yeah, you did. Uh, you day two na the nationals ultimate time wizard event, right? Did you? Top yeah. I, uh, no, I didn't. I didn't top. I I got twenty second. I think it was either twenty second or twenty ninth. Yeah. And then the at the bbg 5k in december which was a big prestigious event how'd you finish there i uh i ended up at 15th place i, I got uh I, I got into the top 16. yeah yeah so certainly plenty of accomplishments and would you say that this sort of arc for you this past year you've seen more success than any other point in your career oh yeah 100 percent. like this is like this has definitely been like my like my, like kind of like my like hero art too <laughs> like same like same as boy this has been just like being able to like play this format again it's just been like a run back trying to like now that we're like 
all of us like a lot older. Our minds are like um, a lot more, uh, a lot sharper, and we're able to like figure things out a lot, uh, a lot more. It's it's a lot. I feel like it's a lot easier to like navigate this format a, li- a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Uh, Boyd, Mike, pass to you. Talk us talk us through just a few of your accomplishments from this past year. Okay, so I definitely went into my hero arc this year, my Superman Batman arc. The only difference is I still have one living parent, which is nice. Um yikes. Dark past. <laughs> usually when you go into your hero arc, that usually means you lose both parents. But anyway, I uh things started off really, really bad for me. Anyone that's listened to the podcast for a long time knows that uh it was very, very bad for a while. Uh, I finally kind of got the monkey off my back at a BBG 2K that happened last summer. I got third place there. Um, pretty much take responsibility for like people playing Junk Synchron and Light Sworn. I think I was the first one to do that. Uh, and it, it kind of snowballed from there. Uh, and I basically I played Light Sworn at almost every single event I've went to in the last year besides one. Uh, so it kind of snowballed from there. Um, I got third place there, won some cash. I won a, a Nintendo Switch Epiconte with the same deck, same list. Uh, I did win a Nintendo Switch at Flashpoint Games last summer playing uh, Frazier's Frog Monarch deck, card for card. Uh, I got fourth place at YCS Richmond in November, fourth place at the BBG 5K in December. And if it's any relevance, I got third place at the BBG uh, Tingu cash oh. tournament in like February. So, very nice, very impressive. So, okay, obviously there's a stark contrast here. Austin was probably one of our best players back in the day. And just to just again to make this clear, it is not as though we have all played Yu-Gi-Oh together since the beginning. Right, we've kind of had these phases where we we stop playing, our whole group kind of stops playing for long periods of time. Maybe one or two will continue to play, but uh, I don't know that we have all been playing quite like this since that 2013 2015 window. Would y'all agree with that? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the band is back together, so to speak. So, just comparing those time frames, when I would say that. Probably Austin, me, maybe Brandon Combs would have been considered our best players back then versus now when Boyd, Ty, you guys certainly have the most tops. Uh, Michael Gammons as well, who plays a lot online. Um, Man, what has happened? And that is the question I would like to dig into this evening. How have you guys leveled up and uh, others have struggled? And then on top of that, I would argue, and I, you guys would agree with me, that in general, our team is just leagues better than it used to be. We maybe had one or two bright spots, but uh, we had a, quite a few milk duds on any given day as well. We would, uh, it was rare for us to go to a regional, for example, and all of us to get our invite. Usually, we come away with one or two. Is that fair to say? Yeah. 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 So, but now we go to an event, and we expect to run that crap. Like the BBG 5K, we had, what, six people go and five people top 16 or something ridiculous like that. Maybe yeah. six and four top 16. I don't know. Like, How many was it of us that uh, that topped the uh, the 5K? It was like, it was you, it was you, Blake, Boyd, me, Gammons, and Chris. Yep. yep. And on top of that, actually after Swiss, we were number two, number three, and number four. It was me, Gammons, and Chris were top two, three, four. And I was 15th. Hooray. And yet you outperformed us all. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So uh, let's talk some very practical things. Here's one that I want to bring up um, and just discuss how Edison is different versus advanced format, especially for younger people. Now, as we've mentioned, I am the grandpa. So back in 2015, I had a real job. I had a family. Um, I was making real money. Whereas some of these guys, they were still in high school. So talk to us about being able to um, access the necessary cards to build your deck to its 
fullest potential and how Edison kind of solves that issue regardless of your budget. Who, who wants to go first? Do you want me to go first? Yeah, it, well, these are just going to be popcorn questions. So okay. anyone can jump in on okay. this. So the thing about like Edison versus trying to like advanced format is like your initial investment is like protected. So I, so if I invest in the format and I play value turbo, I could essentially never change a single thing in the main extra or side literally ever. I would never have to buy new cards. Nothing would ever get banned. No, nothing would ever get limited. And it is very, very nice to be able to just play a game that's like that because Regular Yu-Gi-Oh! is not like that. There are new sets that come out two, three times a month. The meta shifts. People start playing different things. All of a sudden, you need this new engine. All of a sudden, a new structure deck comes out. The whole format's changed. So it's definitely a lot easier to keep up with. Just being closed off. Not having to worry about Konami coming in and just wrecking your entire deck. You know, you're And the decks are all affordable. Even like the most expensive deck, which is probably maybe Amaryllis. That's probably the most expensive deck. Like three Amaryllis is like $150, probably something like that. That's like one card for advanced format. You know what I'm saying? Like you get three Amaryllis for the price of one card and the rest of your deck is just so dirt and you can come into the format. You can build your deck all commons and rares and spend, you know, 50 bucks. You can do max rarity and spend a thousand bucks. It's just whatever you make it. And there's something that's just really appealing to me about that. Yeah. Ty, I think you could speak to that as well as, as someone who truly was a fan of Dark World, but you probably played it far many for, far more formats than you would have if you could have just went out there and bought any deck that you wanted at will. Is that a true statement? Oh, yeah. That's that's definitely a true statement because they're like as, like as time went on, like I was a, like, you know, I was able to you know, luck up and get my hands on other and like get my hands on other decks. Like, you know, I got to see, I got to see what I had been like missing out on and, you know, stuff like, uh, stuff like that. And to speak more on what, uh, uh, what Boyd was saying is that, like, it really is nice to have the option. Like if you want your deck to be expensive or not, like, Edison is literally only expensive if you make it expensive. Like your deck could be fifty bucks, your deck could be five grand. Like it's and it's it, and it's not forced on, and it's not and like the price not forced onto you like it is in modern. Like I like there's no like there's no way, <laughs> especially now in like you know like I'm a dad and stuff like that. There's no way I'm I'm dropping like twelve hundred dollars on a deck that might get banned like next month or a geek power crap next month there's just no there'd be no way yeah yeah Austin, you and i have uh discussed this at some point um just how the fact that these guys when we were all playing then they're maybe they just were younger or they didn't have the jobs necessary to go and purchase you know a full play set of whatever the newest and shiniest toy was i think we could also add some very practical things like hey like it or not, your brain actually doesn't finish developing until around age 25. So hate to say it, guys. Back then, y'all were dumb and I was smart. So uh, <laughs> that was part of it. You know, you just you don't make the same decisions um, when you're a teenager. Your brain is literally different. I mean, this is documented scientific development. So, yeah, one day you're uh, you're 17 yeah. years old and you think the Noble Knights are the best deck in the format. And then one day. <laughs> You're sitting down on a podcast 12 years later or not 12 years later. Yeah. 12 years later, almost. And you're like, wow, I was a freaking idiot. Yeah. Couple <laughs> that with the fact that you played at a locals where three different people played Medulce and they just, tried yeah. To play. yeah. And I'm like, I don't need, I, I have effect Valor, you know? And I, I think back, I never Valored a Tiramisu. I would always Valor like the cat. And then you have like an yeah. extender. And I'm like, now I'm just like, why didn't I just wait for the stupid queen? What was I doing? <laughs> I'm Actually, even now thinking about it, I'm not so sure. Because if you let me do full combo, I get Chateau, I get Ticket, and I still got a 2700 beater. 
Yeah, this is facts. Yeah, but Noble Knight's the best deck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyways, beyond these practical things, being dumb and being poor, um, Austin, talk to me for just a moment. I, I would argue that there is a completely different approach, even a different skill set required for success in advanced format versus Edison format. What are your thoughts on that? I, I agree, and I could be way off here, but this is one reason I think that I was a little bit better back then. I feel like this is one of the reasons I could like constantly top, do really good. It was the way that I adapt to the game. Like I have like a really fast read on my game when everybody's still like trying to solve it or figure it out. Versus Edison solved, and I struggle with that. Like when everybody knows way more than me, I just have a hard time with the game. I feel like. But back then, I mean, besides being able to buy whatever I wanted, whatever deck, that did play a part in it. I do agree. But I could also just, like, I feel like I was ahead of the curve. Because I could, I would, like, just do stuff to outsmart the people, I guess. Like, I had, like, a, a steep learning curve, but it was really fast. And Edison, I just can't crack that. Everybody's just really good. And it's, it's a hard format. Yeah. Yeah. On top of that, you know, the game, kind of to the point that you're getting at, Advanced is constantly evolving, constantly changing. How cards interact constantly changes. And so if you are learning those interactions, learning the rules even, it's not a given that your opponent is going to know those interactions or those rules. But you get above 500 in Edison, and it's highly likely that the person on the other side of the table is going to know how those cards interact in Edison. Because whether they learn quickly or learn slowly, all they have to do is just keep learning. And eventually, they will get it. So reps go a lot further in Edison than they do in Advanced. Uh, what do you have to say about that, Boyd? Talk about repetition and how it pays off in Edison versus Advanced. So it's a lot of like what you said. Like You can sit down and you can research every ruling every card interaction that there is in edison because it's a closed format so everything that exists is everything that will ever exist within the format or you know you can you can just play ten thousand games and learn the same thing you know just through experience where like advanced format like i'm pretty confident that if i really could put the time into advance that like i know what it takes now to be good and what that would mean would be like coming home, playing on Dueling Book every single day, hours, every like, and it would just be like, let's just say like, I'm not even playing the best deck. Let's say I'm just playing one of the other best decks, learning how to play that deck versus all the best decks, and then learning how to play every deck against the best decks. So this is like infinite amounts of time being dedicated to get the reps in advanced format. And they don't even go that far because a month later, or probably not even a whole month, a new set comes out and you start completely over from where you were. Mm, yeah. So it's just, it would be so much work and for actually just like not that much payoff. Like I feel like a lot of like no one that plays Yu-Gi-Oh plays for the prizing. Like, you know, like our prizing is, is terrible, but in Edison, I mean, I feel like the prizing is just a lot better because you're actually getting like, you're able to profit off off of your success, not just getting like the bragging rights kind of thing. Yep. Yep. That that's an interesting point Boyd about time level or the amount of time that you're putting in, in effort to become good at the game versus the rate in which it changes. And Ty, I think that's relevant for you because I, I don't know if I've ever said this to you personally, but I've certainly said this about you to other people on our team that you seem to me like the kind of person who learns through a lot of reps some people learn, I don't know if you guys ever went over this in school, but you at some point may have taken a test to evaluate whether you were an auditory learner, a visual learner, or a kinesthetic learner. And uh, Ty, I feel like you learn things by doing them over and yeah. over and over again. How has that been helpful for you in Edison versus advanced that one month is here and then, then the next month is gone and changed? Um, the way that's been like the way that's been helping me is just like it and like you're and like you were 100 you were 100 right you like you get the nail on the head when it came when it comes to me like it's like being able to 
I, I, I'll start off like just trying my best to learn what like what deck I'm playing at the time. Like right like right now I play you know, you know I play Diva Hero. I have like I, I have a lot of reps with that. And like it it took me a while to get to the point where I'm at with the deck now. Just I start off le- just learning the deck itself. Then I go into learning the matchups and like playing those ma- playing those like different matchups that I may struggle with over and over and over and over until I feel like I can fit until I feel I'm at a comfortable spot with it where I feel like I'm not excuse me uh, where I'm not as nervous to play against these decks when I when I sit across from them. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Let me ask you this, and this is open to the whole group here. Anyone who wants to answer, true or false? Deck building is more important in advanced format than Edison. Hundred percent. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, Defend that. Why is that? The 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 way that deck building in, in uh, advanced now is like it's not the same it's like it's not the same back when we were like in like 2013 or like 2013 2015 to to right now and like uh i'll call it like modernized edison just be all right just because like a lot of uh, like back then when we were playing like 2013 2015 like you know we had patrick hoban you know who to oh like in his you know upstart goblin theories and stuff like you had to play close to close to 40 or lower as possible uh, that you could and with advanced now they're playing 43 46 50 card decks and it, it, it like the decks are still just flowing so consistently and it's it, 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 they're more the decks are more toolboxy now than they are than they were back then like that that's that's the best way that's the best way I can describe how decks are now. Like they're more toolboxy than they were back then. They were more uh, the I feel like back then they were like it was more so just trying to like streamline to get like your like get like a con- like get like a specific combo going. Yeah, Austin, uh, let let me pitch that then to you. Um, you defend that statement. Why is deck building more important? than advanced. I mean, the reason I say that is like, and honestly, the biggest, the most important thing is your side patterns and your side decking. And that's, that just sounds so easy on paper, but it's actually really hard to do. And a lot of people think they grasp that concept, but they just don't. Versus in advance, I think Ty hit it right on the head with that. Everything is such a toolbox and your, your deck building is just way different. Um, you can get away with a lot of stuff in advanced versus Edison. I feel like where Edison is a whole lot more solved. I feel like it's just harder to get away with stuff. It's harder to deck build. Like we might find like a rock stone deck here and there and Amaryllis burn here and there that pops up. But in advance, it's just, I don't know. It's just crazy. Like I, I don't understand advance. I've been diving into it for the last two weeks, a little bit more, but everything is a toolbox. Like Ty said, uh. Yeah, I I think maybe one thing that could be said that hasn't been mentioned is, first of all, the advanced card pool is approaching infinite, right? So the uh, the amount of innovation possible is uh, exponentially greater than that of Edison, right? We have a limited card pool. It's a closed format. And on top of that, because the format is constantly evolving in advanced, your creativity and your capacity to read the meta and build accordingly, I think goes a lot further than it does in Edison. Whereas someone might come in and change two cards in value. And it's this revolutionizing, you know, change. Oh, this hot new tech. We're, we're building entire decks now with these two cards in mind. Whereas advanced, you might have um, Exodia suddenly uh doing well in a YCS which I think just happened not too long ago correct yep. yeah uh, yeah it, it did it did well on the stream it did well on the stream and the it, it was for, they were showing yeah it ended up winning that match so I, anything is possible in advance see me oh, yeah. and who knows what advance would look like if the game were just cut off right now and they were given two years to theorize with their card pool I'm sure it would look very 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 different probably even more different 
in two years than Edison does compared, compared to the original 2010 format. And it's evolved a lot since then. Yeah. Okay. Cause like in advanced, you're having to like tournaments happen pretty frequently in advanced. So like you don't really have time to say like, okay, well I'm going to test out this, this deck that's like tier 1.5 tier two, but I think that it has very good matchups into the best deck. Um, like you're not going to have time to play a thousand games against the best deck with a deck you think is good against it. Even if that deck might actually, you know, be able to go toe to toe or even be better than the best deck just because the tournaments are so close and you're having to just prepare for the next tournament, you know, a week after you've already played one. Yep. Well, we are rounding the home stretch, I think, of our time. And so uh, I want to try to bring this to a head. We started our conversation off this evening by discussing how and why you guys are doing so well. Uh, others of us who have succeeded in the past aren't doing as well. And why is it that our team as a whole is collectively doing better than we've ever done before? Is it a fair statement to say that um, those who put in the time, put in the reps, that actually play your skill, not, not, that's not the right word for it, um, navigating a duel, navigating a duel, anticipating, making reads, that that is more important in Edison than deck building. Is that a fair statement? I think so. Yeah. I think yeah. that deck building is important, like in every format, but I think that like fundamentals of Yu-Gi-Oh, like you said, player skill, knowing how to navigate a game is just so important in Edison because obviously when I first started trying to play Edison, you know, I just wasn't good at the game. I didn't know the fundamentals of the game because I just, I'd never been taught the fundamentals of the game. So like when you play advanced format, or at least the way advanced has been in the last few years, the game is over in like two to three turns. Like you make your board and either they break it and the game's over or they don't break it and it, it ends on your next turn. So when you go to a format where it's like for my first move, I'll summon Swamp Frog and send a Treeborn Frog. Now I'll return my Swamp Frog and pass. And the game goes 10, 15, 20 turns as a player leaving modern to play Edison, that was unheard of. So like trying to navigate fields, trying to make reads. Cause like in advance, you don't really make reads. Like a lot of stuff is just kind of like, okay, well literally every hand trap is at three, every good cards at three. Like you kind of just have to just play as you normally would anyway, and just kind of hope for the best. So yeah, it's like you can kind of pick, you know, what do I hard lose to here? But you might just get hit with a separate counter that kind of, does the same thing essentially. But yeah, I, I think that like knowing the rulings, knowing the interactions, knowing like the deck builds, um, you know, like our black wings, have they been on legacy of Yada lately? Uh, Vayu, are they on spirit reaper in the main deck? Just stuff like that. I think really goes a long way in Edison. That for that reason, I'm going to, suggest here's my encouragement to anyone out there who's trying to get better at edison and it feels like they're just trying to dig through stone um i think for that reason that if you just put in enough time that eventually you will get better at edison unlike and i think michael you'd be a good person to speak to this you could put in so much time in advanced and that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to become good at advanced because even by the time you start to get a grasp on something, it could go and change into something totally different. Exactly. And so your capacity to learn the format quickly, to make reads on the format, to buy the new cards, all of these other factors come into play. Whereas Edison, if you just put in enough time, then you will improve. Doesn't mean you're going to be the best, but you will become much, much better than you yeah. are when you begin. And Agreed? I've seen that like I've seen that firsthand. Obviously I won't name names, but I've seen players in advanced format that I know that I've went to locals with that in these longer stretches of formats where there's not as many sets coming out, the sets aren't quite as relevant. The decks pretty much stay the same aside from maybe a few side deck cards. They'll start to do really, really good. They'll start to win, you know, case tournaments. 
get very close to topping a YCS, you know, top eight a regional here or there, whatever. And then all of a sudden, you know, new set comes out that changes the meta and you don't really see them doing well anymore. And for a while I was just like, oh, you know, they're just, it's just luck, you know, kind of the same thing I, I said about myself. It's just luck. But in reality, it was like they got the reps in, they got the time in, the seat time, and then all of that went away when the format changed and they kind of just had to start over. Yeah. Yeah, so my word of encouragement then, Austin Butcher, and to anyone else out there, dude, just keep playing. Just keep slamming cards. I think that uh, as long as you stay committed to Edison, you you will see improvement. And I, I can speak to that as well. I mean, my first four or five months in Edison, I bubbled just kind of like Austin was saying he did. And then the last three months that I played, I pretty much topped every event that I went to, including one bigger event that I, that I went to as well. Haven't played yet in 2024, haven't gone to an event, but I still feel that it's going to sound a little arrogant, but I feel like I'm pretty freaking good. Like I feel confident now in Edison and I did not feel that a year ago, you know? Yeah. Um, so keep grinding, keep grinding. One one final thing that I want you guys to reflect on, and then we'll close our time. What about this expression? A rising tide lifts all ships. Discuss that and how it's relevant for our team becoming better as a whole at Yu-Gi-Oh. It's uh, it's really pushed us to get better. Honestly, like we're we're always forced to if you think about it. Like, uh, I've only been playing for, like, six months now. Maybe maybe a little bit longer. But, like, I've been forced to step up my game because, you know, Boyd and Ty and then you, y'all are doing so good, so I'm playing with good players. Y'all are way up there, and it forces me to get up there. It's forcing me to, you know, ride that tide, get higher, play better. Um, there's just a lot that goes into it. When you play with better players, you're going to be better. It's kind of like your friend group. If you hang out with people that are married and have kids, you know, you, you start with that. I, I, I agree with that. Like, um, to touch more on that is just like, it, it goes back to that old, that old saying of uh, steel sharp and steel. Like, we're like, you know, if you're around, if you're around like a really good playing circle and like, then you're like you're you're gonna you're gonna you're not gonna be stagnant. You're gonna you're gonna improve and get better. And like the with the like if you start to like you know keep playing with like more uh, more and more and like and the thing and like the thing also with Edison is I think that gives us the ability to re uh, reach these higher level uh, higher levels of like I I guess. I guess I say comp competency for like uh, lack of a better word. Sure. Um, is this we have we like where it's a lot format? We have infinite seat time. We don't like we don't have to worry about this changing. Yeah. Like yeah. The, like the decks the like the whatever's winning might rotate a deck or two here and there, but like for the like like we're always going to have infinite seat time. Yep. Agreed. And if you're playing with someone who's doing extremely well, like Boyd did this past year, uh, just as Austin said, you're, you're going to become better through those interactions. And one thing that I think has helped us, and this will be our final comment for the night, um, is actually in a wild way, not having a locals. We don't have a locals in our, our hometown, not for Edison at least. And for that reason, we don't really compete against one another. And therefore, we share everything with each other. We're not holding back tech secrets. Um, we are just forthcoming with every innovation that we have in the game. And uh, it's just a giant pool of shared information. And I think we're all improving because of that. So, I agree. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Good I want to add something else, too, um, while we're on that topic. Way back when, you know, when we would go to events like 2014, 2015, we'd always talk about like the circle, like the Hoban circle, you know, Hoban, Desmond Johnson, Billy Bragg, Jeff Jones, all these guys, right? Like, oh, well, they're all so good because of the people in their testing circle. And, you know, we've gotten kind of like a taste of that, you know, like we're lucky enough to where like a lot of the tournaments we go to, we play against like 
Ryan Prescott. We play against Mitchell Nouse Hydro Pump. We play against Cameron Saunders. Silchus Ruin. All these guys that are so good at Edison, like we've gotten the opportunity, you know, to pick their brain or have them on, you know, podcast episodes. They're a text message away. You know, all of that, we've kind of gotten to really, I guess, see what that was like, you know, to just be involved with the good players, play against them. And it definitely really does like polish your gameplay and make you better by just playing against people that are better than you. Yep. I, w- I want to add one. I want to add one quick thing in real fast. Um, like the touch on what, uh, what you just said, Boyd. And like, we talked about this earlier, like, like earlier in the week or like last week or something like that. Like we're like, where we didn't have, like we're, we had like good, like good players, like back in the day, like, you know, we had, we had Gammons, we had Combs, like, you know, we, we like, we had the, good like good players, like, you know, like to us, they were like like amazing, but like we didn't, you know, like but you compare, you know, you compare us to like, you know, being like in like like locals and like they had like tech like in Texas they had like you have Billy Bright, Chris Bowling, Philly Luna, all under one all under one roof, and you know that was you know we like we did the best that we could with what we had, but like you know we you know. I feel like what we'll, like we we did we're doing a lot we're doing well with what we had even though we didn't have that. Yeah. Yep, that's true. All right, Boyd, you want a final word before you sign this off? Okay, so uh, I think that we were able to get a lot of good information from this. Um, obviously, I do have several other podcast episodes where we've kind of discussed similar topics. Uh, things that you can do to help improve. I've shared my story quite a few times. Um, And I always try to end these videos by saying, if I can do this, literally anyone can like for so long, I just felt like I was so terrible at Yu-Gi-Oh could not get better. And these are like, these are just the things that I did to just get better. And it's not going to happen overnight. Like you may like I showed up to my first, like several Edison tournaments and didn't win a match. I think my first two, I didn't win a game against anyone. And eventually, like, I took going one and four as a victory over going zero and five. So, you know, just try to uh, stay motivated, keep playing. And like Blake mentioned earlier in in this episode, you will get there. Um, It takes different amounts of time for everyone. So just keep going and you'll definitely get there. Anything else anyone wants to add before we uh, peace out? Amen, brother. Okay. All right. Well, good job, guys. Thank you all for listening. This is Mike and the rest of the Edison Club signing out. Until the next one.